Ooh. I'm really feeling like drawing. <laughs> okay. Um, the plan here today is we have a little bit to finish up in section 15.5. Hi there, how are you? Hi. Good, how are you? Just fine. Corey, it's for you. I don't think it's a bad one. Um, so yeah, we have we have a little bit to finish in section fifteen four, um, and then I'll be done with you guys for today. You can spend the second half of class working on your homework or finishing your delta maths or whatever is kind of high priority for you. Okie doke. All right. Fair enough. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about are some applications. So we're going to look at some real life situations in which we can use an exponential or logarithmic equation to kind of uh, describe or model that scenario. So we're going to see instances in like earth science and chemistry and physics and um, you know all these good old sciences. Okay. Whoa, Billy. There we go. All right, the first situation is like a physics y kind of situation. So this is um, describing sound intensity or the how loud something is. Uh, we the level of sound intensity is measured in the unit called decibels. And we can calculate the uh, sound intensity in decibels by using the following equation. Beta equals 10 times the log of I over I naught, where beta is just the number of decibels. I is the sound intensity measured in watts per meter squared. And then I naught is a constant. I naught is 10 to the negative 12 watts per meter squared. And this represents like the threshold of human hearing, like what's the quietest sound that a human can hear. And now I realize that's going to vary from person to person, but that's like a biological kind of average. So based on our biology, like what should be the quietest sound that like a fully functioning human ear could catch? Yes. Correct. So that's an I on top and an I not on bottom, where the subscript is a zero. The symbol in the denominator is called I not. That's an I with a zero as a subscript. So let's look at an example here. So this says, given the sound intensity of busy city traffic is approximately 10 to the negative 5 watts per meter squared, what is the measure of busy city traffic in decimal, decibels? Since it's asking for decibels, I know I'm going to be using my decibels equation. The question asks for the measure in decibels. So I know what we're going to be looking for is the beta. So I have two things to fill in. I need to fill in the value for I. If I go back and I read, I is the sound intensity measured in watts per meter squared. So that's got to be the 10 to the negative 5 watts per meter squared from the problem. What's going to be the I naught, though? 
I don't have anything to fill in for that in the question. What's going to go in that spot? The 10 to the negative 12, because we're told that I naught was a constant. So I naught is always that same number. Oh, well, she golly willikers, that's okay, no big deal then. So go ahead and fill all that stuff in. Now at this point I could type this into my calculator, but I don't need to. Um, so 10 to the negative 5 divided by 10 to the negative 12, how do I simplify that? If the bases of those exponentials are the same, if I have 10 to the negative 5 over 10 to the negative 12, Lucas? Subtract the exponents, great. So negative 5 minus a negative 12 it's the same thing as negative 5 plus 12, which is just 7. And then, hey, when I just write log like that, what is the base on that logarithm? 10. Good. So I remember that log base 10 and exponent base 10 cancel. So I'm left with just 10 times 7, or 70 decibels. What you guys think on that? No big deal, right? And again, keep in mind that there's nothing wrong with just typing that spot into your calculator and just pressing enter, right? We didn't need to do it that way, but you could have just, at that step, just typed that all in and pressed enter. What's up? Yeah. Sure. Any of those steps along the way? All right. Uh, the next situation is dealing with earth science. So we're talking about the Richter scale. What does the Richter scale measure? Does anybody remember? Earthquakes. Yeah. So it's designed, the Richter scale is designed to register the magnitudes of earthquakes. So the magnitude is the R, and then we have log of A over T plus B. The A is like the amplitude, so that's like how much the Earth is moving up and down. Everybody's okay with that? T is the period of the associated wave in seconds. So T is like the amount of time it takes to go for the ground to go up, to go down, and then go back to the starting place, right? Do you think that's going to be a big number or a small number? Itty bitty tiny number, right? Because what's happening during an earthquake? Ground's moving up and down really fast. Everybody agree? Do you think about what an earthquake should look like or feel like? Probably most of us haven't ever experienced an earthquake. Has anybody experienced an earthquake? I was living in, so in like southwest Michigan, and there's a like a magnitude four or five, I think, earthquake in Illinois that I could feel just like I was in my bed asleep, like in the morning, like right before waking up, and was like. Is this is this is the house shaking a little bit? And I didn't think anything of it because it was like, you know, like ten seconds or something, and it was like barely felt like it was moving. But it turned out there was an earthquake in Illinois that morning. I was like, huh? But that's what that was. Yeah. All right. Um, and then B B is a constant that accounts for the weakening of the wave with increasing distance from the epicenter. So basically what the B is is a correction factor because most of the time when you're taking a measurement, you don't know where the earthquake's going to happen. So the equipment you have that measures the earthquake 
probably isn't at the epicenter, right? It might be a mile or two miles or 10 miles or 100 miles or whatever, some distance away from the epicenter. And the further you are away from that epicenter, like the less intense that earthquake's gonna be, right? Everybody agree with that? So the B, what it does is it corrects for that, your measurement being far away and says, oh, really far away, it felt like a two, but at the epicenter it was really like a seven. So we have to add some on after we do this calculation of what we measured here to account for being far away. Is everybody okay with that idea on what we mean by the B? You guys are enthused as always. Let's look at an example. That is not at all where I wanted that to land. I want you to land up here. Okay. The infamous San Francisco earthquake had a Richter scale magnitude of 7.5. How many times more severe was the most severe earthquake ever reported? The 1960 Chilean earthquake that had a Richter scale magnitude of 9.5. So, when we talk about the severity of the earthquake, what physically should a, as the most severe earthquakes feel like? The ground should be moving up and down a lot, right? The more up and down you have moving, the more intense that earthquake should be. Everybody agree? That if you're barely moving but it's going really fast, that should be, that's kind of nothing, that doesn't matter. But if you're really moving a lot, even if it's slow, that's going to be like cuckoo crazy, like everything is falling down around me, right? So what we want then is how many more times severe was the most severe earthquake ever recorded? So we know that R1 that's the San Francisco. Is should look like this, and that R was 7.5, but that's all we we're given. And the other R, R2 for the Chilean earthquake, would be like this. And that's equal to 9.5, but like that's all the information we're given there also. What we're going to want is like the ratio of those two amplitudes. If I can figure out the ratio of those two amplitudes, we should be good to go. Okay, first things first. We're told that the Richter scale measurement for San Francisco, right? And the Richter scale measurement for Chile, correct? Those are, that's the information that we're given? If we're given a Richter scale measurement, that measurement's already had the correction factor applied to it. So essentially what that means is is that correction factor is now like zero. So we can just kind of like forget about the Bs. Because if we've already been reported a Richter scale measurement, the correction factor, whatever it would be, had been, was applied, was applied. So it can just be zero now. Everybody's cool with that? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat this like a system of two equations. And I'm going to just subtract the two equations. So 9.5 minus 7.5 is just 2. And 
and then I'm going to have log of A2 over T2 minus log of A1 over T1. What can I do when I have two logarithms that are being subtracted? I can condense those logarithms, right? Which of our three properties of logarithms is going to allow us to condense them if they're being subtracted? Oh, please, anybody? Starts with a Q. Quotient property, yeah. So that allows me to rewrite this as log of a2 over t2 divided by a1 over t1. And I have a fraction over a fraction, right? So I'm just going to think about that as multiplying by a reciprocal. and just do a little bit of light rearranging and I can write it like this. So far so good? Now, the problem here is we don't know anything about T1 or T2. Right? We're not given any information about those. But here's the thing. During an earthquake, is the ground moving up and down fast or slow? Really fast, right? So for the most part, those two numbers are going to be really close together anyways because they're going to be really small numbers regardless, right? So what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of assume T1 is approximately equal to T2. They're just about the same number. So I can just kind of cross them out. I know, you hate that. But that's what we need to do. Okay? So last thing I need to do is get that log or get rid of that log there. What is the base on that logarithm? 10. So what exponent base do I need to use to cancel that logarithm? 10. So I have then 100 is equal to a2 over a1. And if I multiply both sides by a1, I get that a2 is equal to 100 a1s, which says the Chilean earthquake is 100 times more severe than the San Francisco earthquake. Because A2 was the amplitude of the Chilean and A1 is the amplitude of the San Francisco. So the Chilean one is 100 times the San Francisco. It's a lot worse. I'm glad I wasn't in Chile in 1960. Yeah, Mr. Kulik, me too. We okay with that one? Okay. 
Okay, the next one is a chemistry situation. So here we're talking about pH. What does pH measure? Yeah, the acidity or basicity of a chemical compound. So what pH is actually measuring though, what acidity is actually measuring is the amount of hydrogen ions inside that solution. So if you take an acid like HCl, when you drop that acid into water, the two ions break apart into H plus and Cl minuses. They disassociate. And it's the amount of H pluses that we measure pH by. So when we talk about pHs, 0 to 14 is the range that a pH can have. 0 to 7 we say are acids. 7 to 14 we say are bases. And if you're dead on 7, we say that is neutral. So your exemplar of neutral is like deionized water, like pure water is neutral pH. Um, most of the water that we get out of our tap is not neutral, though. Why not? It's got stuff in it. It's probably slightly basic if you have softened water. That's what they're doing to your water is they're putting some chemicals in it to make it a little basic. Anyways, chemistry class is now over. So, uh, Let's look at an example here. So it says a really sour lemon is found to have a pH of 22 and a bottle of bleach is found to have a pH of 10.2. What are the hydrogen ion concentrations of the two items? Okay, so we have for the lemon, the pH is 2.2. That's going to equal negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions. So to solve for that concentration of hydrogen ions, the first thing I need to do is multiply both sides by a negative to move the negative sign to the other side. And then to cancel out that log, what do I have to do to both sides? Exponent base 10, good. So those guys cancel each other out. And just so you guys, if you don't remember from your chemistry class or whatever, um, when we put the brackets around an ion like that, that's the symbol for concentration. So this is concentration. Um, so when I type that into my calculator, I get 0.00631-ish. That's moles per liter. Or in chemistry speak, what do we call that? Molarity, right? Molarity. So you could use like the capital M also is okay. If you guys had chemistry, you don't remember this? Molarity? Concentrations? Well, mol moles are different than molarity. Molarity is moles per liter. Okay. Like all years, stoichiometry and first year chemistry. All right. Uh, if I do the same thing for bleach, here we have 10.2 is equal to negative log H plus. But the steps here are going to be exactly the same, right? So I'm just going to like.
shortcut here to the end. And when I type this into my calculator, I get 6.3 times 10 to the negative 11 moles per, well, that's not how you spell moles, Mr. Gulick. Moles per liter. Oops, that's not part B, though. That was still part A. Part B says, how many times greater is the hydrogen ion concentration of the bleach than the lemon? I think that's a typo because obviously the lemon has more hydrogen ions than the bleach because, well, the lemon's an acid and the bleach is a base. So I think they probably meant that. So I'm going to take that hydrogen com concentration for my lemon and divide it by the hydrogen concentration of my bleach. And rather than using the numbers, I'm going to use the exponential. And again, since I'm dividing these, what do I have to do to their exponents? Subtract. So that's going to be 10 to the 8th. So 10 to the 8th is 100 million. So we'd say that the lemon has 100 million times the hydrogen concentration of the bleach. Of. Woo! That's a, uh, that's a lot of hydrogen ions. Make sure you tell your chemistry teacher that you did like four minutes of chemistry in your math class. What's up, Serms? Sure. All right, we got one more situation to talk about, and this is like a chemistry physics crossover. It's called Newton's Law of Cooling. So what's going on here is if like, you know how like when you heat some food up in the microwave or whatever, and then you set it outside and you let it cool? It's basic, Newton's law of cooling is gonna basically describe the rate at which that substance is gonna be cooling, whatever that food is. So our formula is given there. Um, T of T is gonna be the temperature of the substance at some time T. T sub M is the temperature of the medium. So that's going to be wherever you're cooling the substance. So if you're cooling it in a room, it'd be the air temperature of the room. If you're cooling it in like a bucket of cold water, then it would be the temperature of the cold water. If you're cooling it, you know, somewhere else, then it would be the temperature of whatever that stuff was. Uh, the K is a constant specific to whatever substance you've heated up. So for example, if you heat up a piece of metal, that cools at a different rate than if you heated up a bucket of water, right? Everybody agree with that? So the K is gonna be specific to the substance that you're working with. And then the lowercase t is just the time in minutes. So let's take a look. So a hard boiled egg is heated to 96 degrees Celsius, placed in a pot of 16 degree water to cool. After four minutes, the egg's temperature is 45 degrees. Find how long it will take in total to cool the egg to a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. All right. Well, this is definitely a, 
a cooling situation. So let's start identifying what these numbers are in the equation. So what is the 96? That's the initial temperature of the heated objects. That's how hot we heated the eggs to. That is our T naught. And then it says we place those eggs in a pot of 16 degrees Celsius water to cool. What is the 16 degrees? That's the T sub M. That's the temperature of the medium in which we're using to cool the eggs in this case. Then it says after four minutes, the temperature of the eggs is 45 degrees. So what is that 45 degrees? So that's actually going to be, we call that T of four, right? That's a temperature at some specific time. And here, then it says, find out how long. So we're solving for the time, little t it takes for the temperature to be 20 degrees. What do you notice that we're missing here? What haven't we been given? What part of this equation do we still need that we haven't been supplied with in the problem? K, right? We're told nothing about the constant for eggs. So when we, the way I would approach this is we're going to use that T of 4 equals 45 to solve for K. And then after that, we can solve the main body of our problem, the time it takes for the eggs to cool to 20 degrees. So if I set this up, I have T of 4 is equal to the temperature of the medium plus the initial temperature of the eggs minus the temperature of the medium times E to the negative K and then the time, which was 4 minutes to get to 45 degrees. How do I solve this equation? What do I want to do first to solve this for K? Subtract 16, good, I would do that first. At the same time I'm doing that, I'm gonna subtract the 96 and the 16. Next thing I should do is divide by 80, is, that's correct. Yeah. 
Okay. What do I have to do after that? I have to use a log to cancel the exponent base of e. So the log with base e is called ln. That's correct. And then my last step should be to divide by negative 4, right? The way I'm going to write that, though, is I'm going to write negative 1 fourth in front so I don't get confused about where that division happens, that it's happening outside the logarithm. So I'm going to go to my calculator and do negative one-fourth times the natural log of 29 over 80. So I get this number, so that's my value for k. I'm going to store that number, so I'm going to press this STO button. Then I'm going to do alpha, and then I'm going to pick the one with the k on it. So I'm going to store that value for k so I can use it later. Since I know I have to use that number in step two, that means that it just makes it easier than having to type all those numbers over again. So in step two, we know that t of t is 20 degrees. The medium is still 16. The initial temperature is still 96. The K is now that number that we just found. I'm just going to write down the letter K, though, because that was a big old long decimal. I just don't feel like writing it down a bunch of times. And now the solving process here is going to be almost identical as what we did before, right? So we're going to start by subtracting 16 from both sides. At the same time, I'm going to subtract the 96 and 16. I'm going to divide both sides by 80. Now, I recognize that I could reduce that fraction, but shoot, this is all going to my calculator at some point anyways. I'm not really in a big hurry to do the reducing. I'll just let the calculator handle it. To get rid of the exponent base of e, we're going to do a natural log to both sides, just like we did before. And then we'll divide both sides by negative k. I'm going to write it as multiplying by negative 1 over k. And then I'm just going to go to my calculator. Now I stored that value of k as k, so I can just kind of recall it here. So when I do that, I get about 11.81. And these are minutes. What if I wanted this in minutes and seconds? What would I do? I wouldn't divide, right? So first thing I'm going to do is subtract off those 11 minutes. Because all I care about is how many seconds is 0.81 minutes. So instead of dividing by 60, I'm going to multiply by 60. So that would be about 49 seconds. Either of those would be OK. Unless the directions asked for like specifically minutes and seconds or something. You know. And that's it. That's all I got for you guys. You should now be able to do 131 to 138 from the problem set. Um, for this weekend, though, you guys should have 
for me, 99 to 130 plus the delta maths, both parts one and two. So the exponential delta math and the logarithmic delta math. Next Sunday, you'll have 131 plus 138 plus whatever we do next week. Should be able to finish up chapter 15 next week. We've got one section left, I think two days. It's a big section, but I think two days can handle it. Everybody feel good? Okie doke. Um, at this point, I'm going to get out of your way and let you get to uh, work on if you have Delta Math to finish up or some other homework to finish up or want to even start on this new stuff. Any or all of those would be fine with me. If you have questions about anything we've been working on, feel free to come on up and ask me questions. Uh, happy to answer. Otherwise, I'm just going to stop talking now and let you guys get math in. Okie doke.